Hello, everyone, and welcome to Technology Tuesday presented by Out of the Box Technology. My name is Jennifer, and I will be your moderator today. I'm in the marketing department here at Out of the Box Technology, and it's my pleasure each and every Tuesday to deliver these webinars to our audiences. So thank you all for joining us. A little bit about Out of the Box Technology. If you haven't joined us before, or maybe it's been a little while, or you're just checking in for the first time, um, we are anything and everything QuickBooks. We are an elite solution provider, um, an honor that we have from Intuit, and we have a whole team of about 40 QuickBooks Pro Advisors that really do know anything and everything about QuickBooks, the whole family of products. We work on data services, business services like recurring bookkeeping, as well as training, integration, support, and more as it pertains to QuickBooks and associated products. So today I am really excited to talk about a year-end accounting checklist. And I have my friend and colleague Tracy Evans with me on the line, and she's really going to dive into that. Um, but a few housekeeping items before we get started. This session is being recorded, so if you just want to sit back and relax and enjoy, you will get a link to the recording later on today, so you can watch it back and you know refer to any notes that you may have had or revisit any of the topics, so you will get that email. Um, additionally, if you have any questions as Tracy and I are going through today's content, you can use the chat um, on your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll be sure to address the questions that you may have. Lastly, we do have a drawing during today's webinar. Um, you should have received a link in your reminder email about an hour ago to fill out a quick little survey um, to be entered into our drawing at the end of today's session. So if you didn't get a chance to do that, um, you can do that throughout the presentation today. We'll do the drawing at the end. And I'll put that link in the chat as well, um, just in case you weren't able to access that a little bit ago. So again, today's presenter is, like I said, my friend and colleague, Tracy. She's a director in our accounting and data services department here at Out of the Box Technology. She really has a passion for client service and accounting. She knows so much. Every time we chat, I'm just overwhelmed by her wealth of knowledge as it pertains to small to medium-sized businesses and their QuickBooks, their accounting, the ins and outs. So she is a great, great person to have for this conversation today. So before we dive in, I do have a quick poll for everyone on the line. Our first poll question, and I'll launch it here in a second, is do you currently have a checklist that you use for your year-end business tasks? So if you can go ahead and just answer those, whichever pertains to you, yes, maybe you have a checklist and you love it. You're just here for uh, some conversation and listening today on this Tuesday. Or maybe you do have a checklist, but it might not include everything that you probably need. And so that's why you're here today. Or no, and maybe you should have one, which I love lists. I live by lists every single day. So I would definitely fall in the category of yes, um, or maybe you don't like lists, so you don't have one, but hopefully today's information will um, show you that it could be a good idea for running your business as we close out this year. So Tracy, um, I'm looking, we have almost everyone has participated in the poll, so thank you all so much. And the majority are saying, no, they don't currently have a checklist, but they believe they should have one. So I'm so excited to see that result. Um, and have you all on the line today. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll and we will get started. Again, we're discussing the year-end checklist that you need, again, as it pertains to your accounting tasks throughout the year. So just a brief look at our agenda today. Um, Tracy is gonna go over some high-level areas of your business that you will want to review at the end of each year at a minimum, some of these could be done throughout the year multiple times, but definitely year end. Um, and then some specific accounting things like reconciliation, deposit accounts, your balance sheet, your P&L, a couple things that you could do to help prep um, for when you give all of your information over to your CPA. And then some additional tasks that we wanted to throw in there that we felt were really important. 
So I will take a breather and Tracy, I'm gonna hand things over to you as we dive into the business review tasks, some of those high level business areas. So Tracy, take it away. All right, well, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, and good morning and afternoon to everyone. Thanks for joining us for out of the box technologies uh, year end checklist edition of our tech Tuesday. We are happy to have you here. Um, according to the poll, I um, Jennifer mentioned that most of you say you don't have a year end checklist. So you are in the right place today because um, we are going to go over everything you need, everything you should be doing, and everything that it's not too late to be starting to do going forward. Um, so I'm going to just start with, um, we have a lot to cover, so we'll start with uh, financial reviews. Um, doesn't it's not as overwhelming as it may sound um this i recommend to my clients should be done on a monthly basis basis um and if you're not doing that now you can always start um but i would highly recommend it to doing that going forward it's not something you, that needs to be you know hours or days of a review honestly 30 minutes to an hour a month should really be all you need to to review everything you should be reviewing in your books every month um, the financial review of your accounting serves as your business report card and will provide you with a wealth of information, not only on the health of your business, but it can also help to identify issues, um, identify mistakes or items that may need your immediate attention. The items that I typically um, review every month include bank and credit card reconciliations, any loan account reconciliations, customer deposit liability accounts, because we want to make sure that that, that number is uh, um, in there is accurate every month going forward. What money you've collected from your customers are what you say is in that account and it's verified. So that's a real important one to make sure is always accurate. Um, other than that, all of the other balance sheet accounts should be looked at, reviewed, transactions in those accounts reviewed every month, um, along with the open invoices and unpaid bill reports, um, otherwise known as accounts payable and accounts receivable agings. Um, and lastly, of course, your profit and loss. I work with a lot of clients and I can tell you one of the big, biggest mistakes that I see are the result of misstated income and or expenses, which results in misstated tax, sorry, tax returns and having to file amended returns or pay penalties that could have been easily avoided by simply doing a monthly or quarterly review of their books. I tell my clients all the time, the investment they make in our services monthly is minimal compared to having to pay double to have an, a tax return amended or having to pay hefty penalties or fines. So uh, with that, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is reconciliations. Why are doing reconciliations so important? Account reconciliation reviews by definition are the process that compares two sets of records to verify the integrity of the balance stated. So each month, you, your controller, bookkeeper, accounting staff should be reconciling all of your bank accounts, including checking accounts, savings accounts, payroll accounts, credit card accounts. You should also reconcile any outstanding loan accounts to make sure the loan balance being reported by the loan servicer agrees to the loan balance that you have on your balance sheet. Reconciliations are so important because they're your proof, if you will, that what you're reporting as your balance at the end of every accounting period, every month, every quarter, every year, is exactly what the bank is reporting. Um, so they are super important and again, they're, they're sort of your proof that what you've reconciled and what your, your file, your accounting file says is agrees with what the bank says. Um, just to give you a little example <laughs> of what can happen um, if you don't reconcile your bank accounts and credit card accounts. Um, 
we had I had a client that uh, came to us. They had filed their prior year tax return, and they wanted just a cleanup project for the current year, get things caught up, things like that. They said their prior year was complete. They closed the books. Their taxes were filed. Just wanted me to review their current year. When I opened their file and started my review, I realized that none of their bank accounts, credit card accounts, loan accounts, nothing had ever been reconciled. So after going back and having to reconcile the prior year bank accounts, we identified several deposits that were never recorded. Some of the deposits were from customer payments, some were from deposits from draws from their line of credit, um, all kinds of different areas these deposits were coming from. So not only was their bank balance incorrect and incorrect going into their new accounting year, their customer deposit account was incorrect, their loan account balance was incorrect, and their accounts receivable was incorrect because the customer payments they received weren't recorded. So reconciliations aren't just to make sure that your bank and credit card and loan accounts are correct. It affects every, you know, a lot of other accounts other than just those bank accounts. So something to keep in mind. Um, one more, one more story about reconciliations. Um, I had uh, another client come to me for a current year financial review, also said that they had um, completed their prior year financials, Prior year taxes were done, they were filed, everything was great from the prior year. So I began reviewing their file. Their bank recs were indeed complete. However, when I reviewed the reconciliation reports, I realized they had hundreds of uncleared items on the reconciliation. So it's one thing to actually do the reconciliation, but an important part of doing the reconciliation is making sure you're clearing all of the items that are on there. Um, you know, she, she stated at the time she wasn't sure what those items were, so she just left them open, but thought everything was okay because at the end of the at the end of it, her account reconciled. Well, that's true, you can reconcile your account, but anything that you leave uncleared is an open item that's posted in your in your accounts. It's just not cleared. So she didn't think it was a problem because she thought if they weren't cleared, then it's not really affecting her books. Well, it is because the transactions were there, so they are affecting her books. However, they were posted. Um, it just left a kind of a big mess in her, her bank accounts because a lot of the items that were uncleared were uncleared because they were posted twice. So um, just a couple of... Uh, not so fun things that can happen when you don't reconcile your account. So I guess the uh, moral of the story is it's very, very important to make sure that you're reconciling all your banks, all your credit cards, all your loan accounts every month. Uh, secondly, second part of the financial review I like to do is uh, the customer deposit liability account. Um, not everybody uses this account. It's typically a, a used in industries such as construction or perhaps a business that produces customized goods where you would collect a deposit from a client before the work began or before it was completed. The company has an obligation to provide those goods or services or return the customer's deposit to them. For your year-end financial review, you want to make sure that any amount in this liability account is still valid and also review the balance to determine if any of it or some of it may need to be moved into a sales account or perhaps refunded to the customer. So if the job was complete, um, the money in the customer liability account needs to be moved over to a revenue account um, and that will clear out that customer liability account. I recommend reviewing this account monthly. Um, I reclassify any completed jobs, as I said, to sales or revenue account as soon as they're invoiced. Um, I usually make a note when I'm making an entry into a customer deposit liability account, what the projected time of completion of the job is. So that way, when you're reviewing it monthly, you kind of have an idea that, you know, oh, this job was supposed to be completed this month. I'm gonna go check and see if the customer's been invoiced and if the job is indeed complete. 
So you want to make sure at the end of the accounting period or at the end of the year that every every transaction that is remaining in that customer liability account is truly should be there and, and the job has not been complete and you're still holding that money for your customer. Um, next item on the financial review is the balance sheet. Um, not typically everybody's favorite report. <laughs> Most non-accounting professionals don't really love the balance sheet, um, don't really understand everything that is on it and why it is on it and what it means. Um, in a nutshell, your balance sheet is your assets, your liability, and your owner's equity. That is why you need a partner like OOTB who can review and analyze your balance sheet for you. We do it every day, all day, and we are pros at it. <laughs> um, what I like to tell my customers also, just as a, as a quick um, go-to when you're thinking about what your balance sheet is and what it means, I always tell them it's the three O's. It's what you own, which are your assets, what you owe, which are you, your liabilities, and what is left over, which would be your owner's equity. So if you can remember that, the three O's, it's a, it's a quick way to, to remind yourself what's included on your balance sheet. Um, the balance sheet's divided into two sections. There's your assets, and then your liabilities and your owner's equity are the, the second section. For your year-end review, a detailed review of each balance sheet account should be performed. Anytime a transaction is posted to a balance sheet account, a detailed explanation should be included in the description or the memo. So for example, if you purchase a new piece of equipment for your business, you want to make sure that you include and, you know, whether it's through a journal entry or an expense that you're posting, you, you know, purchase that equipment. Um, you want to make sure you include any details you can about that purchase because it's going on your balance sheet. So this is information that will need to be provided to your CPA at the end of the year. So what I like to include is um, obviously the date will be on there just because we have to date all journal entries or expenses. But I also include um, any information, information such as the make, the model, the serial number, um, who you purchase the equipment from, if you purchased it from, um, from um, you know, a company whose whose legal name is, you know, ABC Inc., but, um, you know, the real name of the company is something more specific, you'll want to put that note in there so you can easily identify that transaction and find it if needed. Um, but that's the information that will need to be provided to your CPA at the end of the year in order to prepare your tax return. So any transaction that goes on your balance sheet should have some, some detail behind it that explains each transaction. So at the end of the year, when you're handing off all of your documents to your CPA, he can easily identify all that information. Um, most importantly with the assets is um, he's going to need to depreciate the assets. So that information that I talked about including um, will help him to determine what the depreciation on each item should be. So um, other the other uh, section of your uh, balance sheet is your liability and owner's equity. Liability is is your anything you owe. So loans, um, you know, balances on credit cards. Um, if you know. Uh, if you owe on equipment purchases, any, anything that you owe is, is what is considered a liability on your balance sheet. Um, owner's equity is, is just what it says. It's, it's the equity that the owner has in the business. So if, if, I'm, um, if I need to give my business um, a capital injection, you know, we're running low and payroll's coming up and I deposit $10,000 of my own money into my business, that, that would be considered owner's equity. So again, any transaction that you're making to any item on a balance sheet should have um, you know, the detailed information within that transaction. So at the end of the year, when you're ready to hand off your information to your CPA, everything, you know, is included in there and everything your CPA will need in order to prepare your tax return. Um, 
Next on the list of the financial review would be the open invoices and the unpaid bills. So again, the accounts receivable aging or the accounts payable aging. Um, this is likely something that most business owners are doing on a weekly, maybe a monthly basis. Obviously, you you know want to know who owes you. So, reviewing the accounts receivable aging, um, you know, for any outstanding invoices, any overdue invoices. Um, you know, why are they overdue? Is the customer having trouble paying it? Was was not you know, was the job not completed on our end? Um, was there a deposit or a payment that the customer made that may have been misposted and misapplied to the wrong customer? So these are these are a couple of reasons that you really want to review that at least monthly. So you can you can nip any problems in the bud, you can correct anything that needs to be corrected. Um, you don't want to wait till the end of the year. And again, I've seen this happen as well. Wait till the end of the year to realize you have a customer that you know owes you ten thousand dollars for the last 10 months and, and you weren't aware. So um, it's a good idea to look at that at least monthly. Um, I know a lot of people do it weekly because, you know, the open invoice report is is money that we're due, and we all want we all want to collect that. <laughs> um, on the flip side, there's the accounts payable aging or the unpaid bills report. Um, usually, this is another one that's reviewed weekly or reviewed monthly because you're writing checks and paying bills every month. So. Um, if your bills are being posted and the due dates are being posted correctly, then when you look at your aging and your unpaid bills report, it obviously gives you a clear picture of, of what you owe and when it's due. And um, you definitely want to make sure that those items are um, are always um, correct because you want to, you know, it, it obviously helps with forecasting for cash flow, forecasting for budgeting, um, you know, who owes you and what you owe are obviously two important factors in that. Um, so the next item is probably one most everyone looks at all the time, and that, that's the profit and loss. Um, again, in layman's term, the profit and loss tells you if your business is making money or not. Um, the profit and loss summarizes all of your rev revenue into categories um, based on your chart of accounts, um, your cost of goods sold, and your expenses. And your profit and loss gives you your bottom line net profit or net loss for a given period. So I recommend doing a, during a monthly review, comparing um, three months, sometimes six months, when you're looking at your profit and loss, pull out your dates to the prior three months or prior six months, so you can kind of do an easy comparison. And when I do this, what I'm looking for is, is any fluctuations that, that seem you know really extreme. So for instance, if one month, I see, you know, if my typical office supply expense account averages about $200 a month, and then one month it's $1,200. I mean, that's obviously a red flag. That's something you can immediately see and go, hmm, I need to open that up and see what's in there and, and see why that's that um, expense is so much higher that month. So I, you never want to just open your profit and loss and look at that one month. You always want to review it against, as I said, the prior three months, the prior six months. Doesn't even hurt to do it for the the prior year. So that way it really shows you your fluctuations, you know, where you can look um, immediately and go, hmm, I think I'm spending too much in this category or, you know, um, my sales seem to really be down in, in you know, this revenue category. It, it just gives you a lot of information and a really good um, starting point to kind of delve deeper and, and drill down and figure out where, where your money's going and where your money's coming from. So, um, the profit and loss and the balance sheet are all categorized based on your chart of accounts. So I wanted to touch on the chart of accounts just a little bit. Um, it really is important to have your chart of accounts categorized or organized in in a in a manner that makes sense. So 
what we like to do with our customers at Out of the Box, we sort of have a standard numerical system that we use. So 1000 number series, for instance, would be all your assets. Anything with a 2000 series of numbers is your liability and so on and so on. So when you're looking at, for instance, your P&L, all your revenue is gonna be at the top of your P&L, those are 4000 series numbers. So if you use subcategories and you, you know, you break down your accounts, you know, you drill down even further, you can, you, you know, you're, you're at least be in the same categories of numbers and it kind of makes it all make a little more sense. So the flow of what you're looking at should go with the flow of your chart of accounts. So it's really important to, you know, not only make sure that you're, um, numbering system in your chart of account makes sense, but that all the numbers that you're using are sort of all in the same category of categories of numbers. So, you know, for instance, you can have your all your payroll expenses, all your different wage accounts, all your payroll tax accounts could all be the 5000 series of numbers in your chart of accounts all of your utilities and rent and you know building expenses would all be the 6000 series of accounts so anytime um you wanted to add an account or you know you you at least have sort of a roadmap to use so you can make sure that all those expenses stay in the same category all your revenues in the same category so really important to make sure that your chart of accounts makes sense it's numbered correctly um one here's a pro tip for using your chart of accounts wait until you've completed your re your year end review um, to inactivate rename or delete any old unused accounts um, it can really wreak havoc for your cpa for your bookkeeper for your controller if you um if you happen to inactivate an account that was you know previously been used or you decide to rename it or merge it with another account because you you know it made more sense for you i typically wait until the end of the year wait until the your you know finances or financial statements have been completed your taxes are done then you can kind of move around and and you know tighten up your chart of accounts after that but um you don't want to get a phone call in february from your cpa asking you what happened to all your assets that you had last year because you changed the name of the account or or merged it with another account so just uh just be careful of that um all right let me i'm just reviewing through okay there we go sorry jennifer <laughs> no that's um, fine that's fine you're doing great, Tracy. This is all really good information. Getting a lot of feedback from the audience that um, this is all things that they really didn't think that they really had to look at um, for such importance and such detail. And even as you touched on the chart of accounts, if mm -hmm. that feels overwhelming to you, um, speaking to the audience members here, that's where we can come in as well here at out of the box technology like tracy said we look at this stuff all the time we can help guide you how to implement some of those numbering systems if you just feel like that's there's too much your chart of accounts just seems to go on forever again that's where we can come alongside you and help with that so um tracy thank you so much for talking about all of those really like nitty-gritty financial review items that are so important to year end and even throughout the year um, assessment. So mm -hmm. yes, of course. So now we're going to kind of dive into just a couple additional year end tasks as Tracy and I were developing the content for this. There was a few things that just kind of stuck out um, that we're going to go over. And so the first is employee addresses. And we're going to talk about employees um, again more at a high level later on. But just as you're kind of tidying up the year, taking a look and making sure you have the correct information for your employees because you're going to be sending out, um, you know, things for taxes as the year turns over. And so just making sure that addresses are correct, contact information, all of that, because that can definitely cause a little bit of a glitch in the coming months. So uh, we just wanted to address that. And then 1099 preparation. I know Tracy can probably speak to that. We just have had a webinar a couple weeks ago about 1099s and how out-of-the-box technology can 
help with those. Um, some, a lot of people in our poll question on that webinar said that 1099s are definitely a source of pain and mm -hmm. anxiety for your business. So don't let that be the case for you. Let us know. We are here um, to help with anything dealing with 1099 preparation, submission, and all of that. Um, and then the other two, Tracy, I'll kind of let you speak to those as it pertains to receivables and inventory, how you'd want to review that at year end. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Um, yeah, just going back to 1099 prep, though, real quick. Um, I understand your pain. <laughs> we, um, the, the, that seems to be the um, feeling for most business owners um, in a source of stress. Uh, but as Jennifer said, um, we are here. Um, we we work with a lot of clients on 1099 um, um, preparing and um, submitting 1099s. But what you can do as a business owner to make it less painful at the end of the year is to stay on top of the um, 1099 prep throughout the year. So what I recommend to my clients is do a quarterly review. If every quarter I have them or I do it for them, um, pull up a vendor summary report. You can, you know, when you're posting or when you've paid a subcontractor, for instance, you're flagging those accounts that are going to be accounts that are eligible for 1099s. And we all know subcontractors are a big one. So once a quarter, I pull the report. I pull a report that shows me everything that I posted to that subcontractor account and I go through one by one. Do we have a W-9 from the subcontractor? Is his address, um, name and address legible? Um, is the information verified? Um, I like to have my clients ask for not only a W-9, but if possible, get a copy of a driver's license or, or another document that would verify some of the information that is on a W-9. Um, I have had in the past um, clients that thought they were doing the right thing, and they were just collecting all the W-9s from their subcontractors they used throughout the year, only to come find out when we were doing his 1099s None of the addresses were valid. Um, most of the social security numbers slash employee ID numbers or EIN numbers were valid. Um, and at that point, we're already, you know, two weeks out from the deadline of filing 1099s. And he had to scramble to try and get a hold of these people that he had paid throughout the year. So what I what I tell my clients is. Do not, do not pay anybody that you are required to collect a, a W-9 from until you collect the W-9. Um, it's, it's just a good business practice to have. Most people understand, you know, that, you know, even if they were hired to do just one small job or, you know, anything over $600, I cannot issue you a check without you, you know, filling out this W-9 form for me. So when I, um, when I'm collecting these W-9s from my client, the only thing I'm really doing is making sure, yes, you can read the address. Yes, the social security number is legible. You know, the name matches the name that we have the vendor listed as in QuickBooks, that kind of thing. But at the end of the year, you'll be really thankful that you did that. <laughs> and honestly, doing it quarterly, I mean, it might take a half hour of, of doing a quick review of the vendor summary report and, you know, making sure that you have all the W-9s needed. So... That's my little uh, quick tip on 1099 prep. But as Jennifer said, we're here for you. So, um, but next I want to talk about past due receivables. I did touch on that a little before, and I guess we'll just reiterate again. Um, this is just a really important um not only year end, but monthly check. You want to, of course, stay on top of your receivables, on top of who owes you money and find out, you know, why the customer hasn't paid or why they're past due. Again, you can find out that, you know, maybe he did pay and, and the payment was misapplied to a, the wrong customer. Um, obviously, we, you know, that's a mistake that's easy to correct. But if you're not looking at this report and not reviewing this on a, you know, pretty regular basis, it's really hard to go back to a customer at the end of the year and say, oh, by the way, 
you still owe me this amount of money and sorry it's taking me eight months to let you know that but you know um obviously that isn't that isn't best case scenario um other i've also had the scenario happen where um there were credits or there you know uh, um a customer of mine had a salesperson that agreed to um, knock off part of a invoice because something was damaged um, on the, that the customer received. So the salesperson promised the customer uh, credit on the invoice. However, the salesperson didn't relay that information to the accounting person. So for months and months and months, this particular customer was showing a past due balance and being harassed by phone calls from the accounting department and you know why aren't you paying or you know the the invoice is still outstanding only to find out that the salesperson and the customer had agreed to this and nobody relayed that information so it's another reason to really review that report um I recommend monthly because again, you don't want it to get too far out of hand and then have to go back to a customer. Um, but even if you do it quarterly, it's it's just a really good idea. And at the end of the day, it's it's money in the bank. It's money that you're owed. So you, nobody wants to leave money on the table. Um, the next, uh, the next, ne sorry, the next task is reviewing your inventory. Um, probably up there with 1099s as far as um, <laughs> not one of the funnest things that that people want to do but reviewing the inventory includes doing a physical inventory account um, depending on the type of business you have where whether you're inventory heavy or not um, i recommend a monthly or at the very minimum quarterly physical inventory account what you really want to do is make we're making sure that what you say is in your inventory or in your warehouse on your shelf computes financially to what your inventory account says on your balance sheet. So, um, you know, in an inventory heavy company where there are, you know, millions of little parts or parts of parts that make up an entire, you know, um, sale item for a customer, there's a lot that can go wrong um you know damaged parts or um you know even damaged by say an employee who's installing a part for a customer and you know drops a screw down the the drain hole and just has to grab another one well if you're counting screw, screws as part of your inventory you know things happen like that all the time all day long you want to make sure you get as accurate accurate account as you possibly can at the end of every accounting period so like i said doesn't mean you have to do a physical inventory account every month but the longer period of time you wait to do that inventory account the longer it's going to take to try and reconcile where your difference was where where you're short or where your damages have occurred so um if you're not doing it monthly or quarterly, you're definitely going to be doing it at the end of the year because your CPA is going to want a physical inventory count number from you. Um, so again, I recommend um, you know staying on top of it, just like with the 1099s, not our favorite thing to do, but the more you stay on top of it, the less painful it becomes at the end of the year. <laughs> um, all right, next next slide okay cpa prep um one of the things um to prepare for this year's end of uh, year end review is to make sure that your last year's books are closed out any adjusting journal entries from your cpa from last year have been posted dated correctly and are in the books for your current year. So a lot of times, um, as you all are aware, the C CPA isn't done with your tax return till maybe, you know, March, April, you know, if you've had your returns extended, maybe not even, you know, till October. Um, so it's a good idea to make sure as soon as your CPA hands you your tax return, ask them for any adjusting entries. If they have access to your QuickBooks file, if you're on QBO and your CPA has access, they may be making those journal entries for you. 
um, because they have access to do so. But if not, or if you're on QuickBooks desktop, it's just a, a good habit to ask your CPA, hey, do you have any adjusting journal entries I need to post? Is if you don't post the adjusting journal entries from last year, your books for this year will also be incorrect. So something really important and you should have it on your year end checklist. And, you know, it's an it's an easy box to check off. Um, like I said, especially with QBO, a lot of times the CPA can just go in there and make the adjustments themselves and there's nothing you need to do. Um, the next item, which is another super, super important item, and I can't say this enough because I had something recently just happen, um, is setting a closing date and a password for the prior year. Um, setting a closing date in QuickBooks is, is easy to do. Um, what that means is you're gonna set a date that says nobody can post anything, uh, you know, beyond um, one, one, 2022 for this year, for example. So if I tried to make a journal entry and I dated it by mistake, 11, 29, 2021, I'm gonna get an alert. Nope, you can't do that unless you know the password. You can put the password in to override it, but it, obviously it's set up so you can't, you know, because we all do it. I mean, you're, you're you know, doing a million things or you're posting journal entries and you hit the wrong, wrong number key and all of a sudden you have a journal entry in the wrong date that's from the prior year. So we, we don't ever want that to happen. Um, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> um, this just happened to me recently, as I said. Um, one of my clients, he came to me, um, he had lost a bid to a competitor and it was for a pretty big piece of business. It would have been a, you know, a significant amount of business for his company. Couldn't figure out why he wasn't showing a bigger profit. Um, he said he was always busy. He was busier this year than he had ever been. Um, he had a lot of revenue. He was really good about keeping a close eye on his expenses. What he didn't do, however, was close his prior year books and set a password. What happened was his bookkeeper, who would post his monthly sales into QuickBooks from their front end software that they use. So every month, his bookkeeper would pull the sales amount from their front end software, software create a journal entry and post it in QuickBooks. One of the month, um, I think it was actually March of this year, she dated the journal entry for March of 2021. Not only did she misdate it, she actually did the journal entry backwards. So instead of crediting sales to post the sales, she debited sales. So she must have been having a really bad day that day. Anyway, the, this resulted in a negative sales amount for the month of March. Um, these two errors could have easily been identified and corrected if A, he was reviewing his P&L, doing a three to six month comparison, as I spoke about earlier. You know, you always want to just not look at one month. You want to you want to um, pull the dates out on your P&L to be at least reviewing three to six months at a time. So he would have easily recognized had he done that. Um, he would have seen the comparison. Oh, you know, looks like I have negative sales from one month. How could that be? Um, number two, had he set a closing date and password for the prior year, that transaction could have never happened because the bookkeeper would have immediately been alert, alerted of it. So um, not only did he have to amend his tax return, but he lost out on a very big piece of business because his financials weren't strong enough to support the work that the client was awarding. So um that's just that's just an extreme story of of a mishap that can result um from from this but again moral of the story you use the set closing date and password every year um you know you don't have to do it as of january 1st but i recommend at least by february so that way who you know you or whoever is um working on your books for you 
cannot make journal entries into a prior year. Also really important that once you hand off all of your paperwork and financials to your CPA, you don't want anybody changing anything. So for instance, if you, you know, if you've submitted all your paperwork to your CPA to start working on your tax return, and then somebody goes in and changes something from, you know, one of the months or, you know, changes a deposit or changes an expense, now the information that you've given your CPA is now incorrect because something changed. So really, really important um, to set a closing date and password so you can avoid those those pitfalls. <clears throat> Thank you, Tracy. Um, again, I just wanted to remind everyone, if you have any questions about anything that Tracy or I go through, um, go ahead and use the chat or the question bar there on your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll be able to address those for you. Um, so we kind of went over all of this deep dive into financial related stuff for your CPA pertaining to QuickBooks. And again, it's a lot, it can be overwhelming, so that's where our team would love to come alongside you. Um, so we're gonna shift gears just a little bit and talk a little high level about a few other areas of your business that you want to review, definitely annually, if not more often. Um, and the first one again is employee review. So I touched on addresses because you definitely wanna check that as it pertains to sending out um, you know, tax documents and whatnot, but also to kind of look at maybe an organizational chart of your um, company. So we use this, this um, model, I guess you would call it draw IO, and we can then take a look at our whole organization and you can see what areas might be heavy, what areas might be light. Um, maybe you have a director that you just kept throwing employees on their team and didn't realize it and another that doesn't have as many people. So it's just a really good way to take a look and make sure the structure of your organization is working efficiently for each of your teams, whether it's um, you know front of house, back of house, admin, wherever it might be, and then what holes you might have. And that can help you in your hiring and recruitment efforts for the upcoming year. So that's an important area to review. Like I said, definitely annually, if not to just kind of keep a look at it as the year goes on. The next area is your vendor contracts. So depending on your business, you may have a lot of vendors that you deal with throughout the year. You have contracts with them. Um, and the end of the year is a good time to take a look at those contracts and see one, are they still applicable to your business? Maybe it's something that's been hanging out um, in your files for years and years, but you don't even work with them. Um, so just to clear that out, or maybe their contact information has updated, maybe they've moved, um, just making sure that that's all accurate. And then if there's any terms and conditions that you need to increase, do you need to adjust um, any sort of financials, any pricing, um, what you're charging, have they changed what they charge you? And so you need to update that in your system. So just taking a look at all your vendor contracts as the year comes to a close. And then customer contracts. So is it time for a pricing structure, structure update with your customers? Um, maybe you have a new way of communicating with your customers and you wanna put that in your contract. Maybe you have developed new company policies. Um, that you want to communicate. So just a lot of things to look at as it pertains to customers as well, um, whether it's your service offerings, like I said, pricing structure, um, all of those things just to take a look at because if you don't and you just let it slide, you'll see that five years have gone by and you've never had a price increase. And that's an opportunity for your company to grow financially as well. Um, Tracy, did you have any comments on any of those, whether it's employees, vendors, or customers from your side of things um, yeah. that our audience might want to look at? Yeah, I just, just um, one thing to remember, like Jennifer said, it's a good time to, you know, review contracts, um, things like that, but especially with vendors, review automatic renewals. 
um, you know, you may not have even realized, you know, whenever a contract was signed, you know, way back when, that you were being automatically renewed on a yearly basis at the, you know, same price, or perhaps it's an automatic renewal with a 10% price increase every year. So you really want to make sure, um, you know, you're reviewing all your vendor contracts you may have in place. Um, and included in vendors, don't forget, are your merchants services so um, I always tell my customers shop around your merchant service provider once a year I mean there's there's plenty of them out there um, the rates do vary um, you know they're obviously their services that they offer vary but the rates vary a lot too and and it's a it's a big expense for a business so if you accept credit cards as payment you have a merchant service provider and it's a good time to review that contract or shop around new pricing um, that kind of thing absolutely thank you Tracy. so that kind of that kind of brings us to the end of our checklist and we covered a lot. So we want you to know that we are here to help. Um, so up on your screen is a year end planning checklist that our CEO and co-founder Denise Litter Cook really kind of puts together. We based our presentation off of that today. It's kind of what all of our consultants really preach to their clients as well. Um, and we would like to share this. So everyone will be getting a copy of this PDF and it's interactive. So you can check the little check boxes as you go, make copies of it. Um, so that is our gift to you today um, is this checklist that we've developed and hopefully you find that beneficial. Um, so with that, I'm gonna open it up for questions and just give a little reminder about our um, drawing that we're going to do in just a few minutes here. If you haven't yet filled out that form, go ahead and do so. Um, I'm entering all of the names into our name picker right now. Um, so we'll do that drawing in just a minute, but right now I'd like to open it up for questions. And Tracy, our first one that's come in is, do we do R&D tax credit appraisal? R&D tax credit appraisal. Um, that is very specific, and I think that's probably something we could discuss offline um, that would require a few more follow-up questions to to kind of understand um, what what the need is. So perhaps that's something we can set up offline and, and schedule a phone call to discuss. Sure, absolutely. I, I would agree with that as well. Um, our next question is, you mentioned some things that could be reviewed quarterly or monthly. Is there a list for those items as well? And uh, Tracy, I'll, I'll start this and then you can add on. Um, we do have um, some checklists of things that you'd want to look at monthly, quarterly, um, weekly, and I suppose you could even get as granular as daily. We don't have a daily checklist, but um, we do have a couple other things that you would want to look at on a more regular basis. And Tracy, would you agree that just depending on the business model, some things need to be looked at more often. Maybe if you're really inventory heavy, you wanna be looking at your inventory more often than annually, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think it's very specific to each business. Like Jennifer said, if, if you're an inventory heavy type business, I recommend you know doing a physical inventory account monthly if you're not or you know or maybe you're not sure if you're not but you know i guess i would base it on how long would it take you to perform a physical inventory count if it's something that would take you know two people an entire week to do that's a lot of inventory and then that's something you want to be reviewing monthly if doing a physical inventory count took one person two hours to do well then that's something you could probably review quarterly because it, it you know you don't you don't have that much inventory and there's less more room for error there so it really is sort of specific to a business but i would you know i i just think it's it's how heavy is your business um you know how many transactions uh are, are on your general ledger and that's how I would base on whether I review it monthly or quarterly. And monthly isn't a must, it's a recommendation. I would say quarterly is a must for all of the items we discussed today. Excellent, thank you. 
Um, well, that's all the questions that I see coming in right now. Again, if something comes up and you're like re-watching this maybe later today or you're sharing it with your colleagues next week and you would like some more information on any of these areas, I will put our contact information up on the screen after we announce our winner for today's drawing. So I put everyone's name who completed the survey. Thank you so much for doing so. And today's winner is Jody D. So Jody, congratulations to you. I will be reaching out to you um, after we close up today and getting your contact information for sending out that gift card. So congratulations, Jody. Um, we appreciate it. And to everyone else, thank you for participating. Um, that really wraps it up for today's content. Um, our marketing team is working diligently on the 2023 webinar schedule. Um, this will wrap up Tech Tuesdays for this year. So kind of fitting year end checklist. This is the year end webinar. Um, but we'll be back in 2023 with a lot of really great topics. If there's something you would like us to address, um, definitely reach out and let us know. Here's our contact information. Um, if there's an area you're struggling with or something that you think that you would like us to present, um, reach out to us. Again, if you have further questions from today's webinar, you can get in touch with us via phone, email, or our chat on outoftheboxtechnology.com. Um, so with that, I would like to thank everyone for joining us. Tracy, thank you for coming alongside me today to give this presentation. It was so much fun. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of 2022. Happy holidays, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks.